Hello everybody. Many uh, people that are called to do this work, to coach, take their development of themselves as coaches and the development of their coaching skills very seriously. They aspire to higher levels of effectiveness, really in pursuit of being the best coaches they can be and hopefully adding the most value to their clients. Now, many coaches undergo various certifications or prepare themselves for an ICF credential, which I believe is a, is a good thing for coaching. These days, there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coaching schools out there. And some of those schools are excellent and many are not. So to the extent that we all work together to raise the bar on professionalism and really seek and uh, and really promote a common recognized set of credentials, I believe it's a really good thing for professional coaching. And, you know, there's good evidence that it's a very good thing for the individual coach. And so any of us uh, senior coaches who reserve some time in our practice to um, oversee, mentor, or supervise other coaches, we regularly see a wide range of coaching styles and approaches and, you know, coaching models and various levels of competencies in the coaches we work with. And as it relates to the ICF core competencies, which really form the background of what you're trained in any uh, approved coach training program and, and thus provides the criteria to determine whether someone is coaching at an ACC, PCC, or MCC level, there's a long list of really common mistakes that we see coaches make. And in service of helping those of you who want to grow your coaching skills, I've put together my list of uh, some of the top seven mistakes I most often see in coaches um, you know, when they when they send in a recording or, you know, submit something for supervision, uh, review or, or mentoring. Now, number one on my list is that the coach is not fully present and really connected as a trusted partner with their client. They're not open. They're not curious. They're not trusting the coaching process. And this is really one of the most common rookie mistakes. And it it shows up as a coach working too hard or having way too much attention on themselves. Thinking things like, is this working? You know, am I creating enough value? Will this client, you know, choose to work with me? Now, having those insecurities is, is natural. It's part of being a human being. But your job is to keep putting your attention back on the client and really trusting the process of coaching. The uh, second mistake, uh, common mistake I see all the time, is that uh, the coach does not get clear or fully explore or stay connected to the client's agenda. Many calls, particularly with ongoing clients, can kind of start nowhere and drift from there and, and, and never really do you see that the, the coaches helping the client get clear on what they really want and then checking in with them in the duration of the, through the duration of the call to make sure that the client's getting what they want and more from the call. The third uh, common mistake I see is that coaches are not listening deeply to the whole client. Um, the thinking verbal brain and the uh, emotional intuitive brain and, and there's not any evidence of intuition demonstrated in the coaching calls. And this is kind of a core competency around powerful listening. When we're nervous, which happens all the time, particularly at the beginning of our career, we can get stuck in the neocortical uh, kind of task positive network, verbal thinking part of the brain in, in words and in concepts. And that, and we miss out on tuning in to the more intuitive, the more subtle emotional currents that are going on. So you really want to develop the skill to be present enough with your client 
and, and have awareness that you're kind of scanning across a broad spectrum of channels to make sure you're really in tune with what the client is saying and not saying and what's going on, you know, uh, with their feelings and really what's going on with your intuition, because that's a huge part of more powerful coaching. The fourth uh, issue I wanted to share with you is that we often see that coaches' questions don't take the client deeper or they don't use the client's language or they don't serve to raise the client's awareness. Um, another kind of way this shows up is that many of the coaches' questions are, are, are well, too many of them really, are focused on the future or focused on the past and there's not much happening in the present moment. And, um, you know, transformations only happen in the present moment. They only happen in now. And usually at a deeper level of thinking and feeling than what the client is, is accustomed to. So if you spend way too much time on the surface of things or, you know, in the past or the future, it can translate into far weaker coaching. You just feel that in the coaching. There's a lot of thinking going on and there's not a lot of, you know, awareness raising and transformation. Another thing that comes up quite commonly uh, with coaches that are developing their skill set is the coach is really nervous about dealing with inner critics, saboteur, shadow stuff. It goes by different names. And, uh, you know, a common thing that, you know, you see is that they'll, they'll step over it. They'll flee from it. Really the first sign of any emotion. And, you know, emotions are are powerful. Uh, Carl Jung used to say that there's really no transformation without first, you know, activating the emotions. And so as a coach, you've got to be comfortable in these areas. You've got to find your way to be comfortable in these areas. And you absolutely need to know the difference between, you know, regular coaching, a healthy client that has emotions, and, um, you know, anything that uh, crosses a line in a therapy and anything that has to be referred out to a, a therapist or counselor. The sixth point I have for you today is that uh, oftentimes in calls you see, you don't get a sense that the coaching is serving or evoking the client's best self. Not, uh, you, you know, the coach is not connecting to the client's greatness. And it's not reasonable to assume or expect that in every call with any coach that there's going to be a, some incredible transformation, that it's going to be some atomic breakthrough. I mean, there's a lot of value in what I call meat and potatoes coaching or everyday coaching in helping a client, you know, um, move into action and stay accountable and all that stuff. However, if that everyday coaching is not in service of, or it doesn't spring from a place of general inspiration, you know, then it's not powerful coaching. And the whole coaching just has this feel of, you know, a pretty narrow bandwidth and not really uh, connecting to what the client really cares of or is, you know, dying to achieve or become. The last point I want to share with you today is, um, a more nuanced point, and it's a little harder to put into words. But if you imagine that, uh, you know, a coach's voice and tone and, you know, kind of speaking style, if you imagine that they were a, a musical instrument, like a violin, you know, how many strings would that coach have on their violin? You know, do they use their instrument well? Or can they play a whole range of strings that cover a whole range of, you know, ideas and spectrums and emotions and circumstances? Um, can they, you know, is there silence in, you know, the music they create from this thing? Because silences are very powerful, you know, parts of music and they're very powerful parts of a coaching conversation. Um, or is the music that the coach is creating just kind of a narrow range of notes on one single string that whether they're coaching the client on something incredibly exciting in there that's happening right now or you know coaching them through some very challenging time there's hardly any change in bandwidth 
you know, that is a, another kind of hallmark when you see really experienced uh, and powerful coaches. You see a, a broader bandwidth. You see a bigger range. They can use their their voice, their personality, their relationship to really create much more, uh, you know, beautiful music with the client. Okay, so those are my seven points for today. And um, hopefully they'll give you a few things to think about and work on. I'd like to uh, direct you to regularly go back and review the ICF core competencies as they do evolve. And you might find another nugget um, that you didn't really understand when you last went through it. And I'd also generally like to keep you, uh, encourage you to look for opportunities to grow as a coach. Coaching continues to evolve. Uh, we benefit from ongoing work in other fields, uh, developmental psychology, applied neuroscience, positive psychology, and many other social sciences. That, and they all serve to help us be better at what we do and really better support our, our clients' agendas. Okay, so that's what I have for you today. If this is a value to you, if you'd like some more uh, videos on these sorts of topics or going into any topic uh, in, in more detail, please email me, let me know what you're interested in and I'd be happy to uh, share more of these if they're of interest to you. Okay, everybody, take care and, uh, and good coaching out there. Be the best coach you can be. Take care.